first meeting in 2016 and indeed session five of the Scottish Commission for Public Audit. I have the honour of chairing this meeting in my capacity as the oldest and clearly the wisest member of the Commission until a chair has been elected. Can I just remind you to turn off your mobile phones and any electronic devices that you might have. Uh, item one on the agenda is the decision to take business in private. Uh, decision, the Commission is to decide whether to take items six and seven in private. Are members content? Thank you. Two, declaration of interests. Uh, members will be invited to declare any relevant interest, starting with myself. Uh, I, will, I will simply say I have nothing additional to my already declared interests in my register of interests. Yeah, similarly, I have nothing to declare beyond what's already been disclosed. I have nothing additional to declare. Nothing to declare. Nothing to declare beyond my register. Thank you very much. Move to item three on the agenda, which is choice of chair. The Commission will choose a chair and uh, I will seek nominations for the position of chair. I propose Colin Beatty. Is there a seconder? I'm happy to second. Are there any other nominations? In that case, uh, I ask the Commission to agree that Colin Beatty be chosen as chair of the Scottish Commission for Public Audit. Are we agreed? Thank you very much. Move on to the choice of deputy chair. The Commission will choose a deputy chair and uh, I would seek nominations for that position. I would propose John Lamont. I'll second that. We have a proposal and a seconder. Any other nominations? Congratulations, John. You've taken on a, <laughs> an onerous position there. Thank you very much. Uh, and we'll go straight on then to item five on the agenda. Yeah, we'll suspend just for a couple of minutes uh, while the witnesses come in. Okay, we move to item five in the agenda, which uh, relates to taking evidence on Audit Scotland's annual report and accounts for 2015-16. And members have a copy of the annual report in their meeting papers, along with the auditor's report on the accounts. I'd like to welcome Ian Leach, Chair of the Board of Audit Scotland. Uh, and Ian's accompanied by Caroline Gardner, the Auditor General, Diane McGiffin, Chief Operating Officer, and Russell Frith, Assistant Auditor General. Can I invite, firstly, uh, Ian Leach to make a short introductory statement? And what I'm going to say is we're on a very tight schedule today because obviously we have to finish to release members to be in the chamber by two o'clock. So I would ask uh, you know, any responses to questioning and so on to be fairly tight. Ian. Thank you, Convener, and congratulations on your re-election. I assume that's appropriate to say. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity of making a brief opening statement. I'm pleased to be able to introduce the Audit Scotland annual report and accounts, my first as chair, and look forward to working with your new commission. Our role as a board, as you know, is to support the Auditor General uh, in her work and also the Accounts Commission, which deals with other aspects of particularly local government and some other areas. And we do this to help to ensure public money is spent properly and effectively on the key public services on which we all rely. I'm pleased also to welcome Professor Russell Griggs, whom your previous commission appointed to our board. As a board, we, we and our audit committee have reviewed these accounts and considered reports from our internal auditors. These are mentioned on page 24 of the annual report. The annual report makes reference to significant political economic changes and challenges over the last year for public bodies. These reinforce the need for us to continue to keep a sharp focus and be able to adapt. We are making sure we organise ourselves to be flexible enough to respond to the challenges ahead. We already have a strong organisation to build on, and I thank the Auditor General, Diane, Russell and all the staff for the work they have done and the commitment they have shown throughout the year. Looking forward, 
there are substantial new financial powers for the Scottish Parliament, which will bring even greater policy choices over tax spending and additional responsibilities for us. Indeed, we highlight this on page nine of our annual report. We have been discussing the implications for Audit Scotland of these new powers and any additional what this implies. And I'm pleased to say that Audit Scotland has actively been considering the practical implications of these developments and we will be able to share our plans going forward when we present our budget proposals to the Commission, hopefully in the next few weeks, depending on your timetable. Thank you, Convener. I believe Carolyn Gardner has got a brief uh, comment or two to make. Thank you, Ian. Very briefly, um, Audit Scotland plays a vital role in helping me and the Accounts Commission to ensure that there's proper scrutiny of public money. Like all public bodies, we recognise that we need to continue to change, to improve and to demonstrate efficiencies. Our strategy for doing that is set out under a, a stream of projects under the banner of becoming world class, um, and we're happy to talk more about how we're taking that forward. A key part of our work is in supporting the Scottish Parliament and especially the Public Audit Committee um, to subject public bodies to effective scrutiny. At the same time as driving change in our own organisation, I believe we've delivered our core work successfully over the last year, uh, producing over 300 annual audit reports, 17 performance audits and all of the accompanying work in supporting the Parliament and its committees. Some of the themes highlighted in the report before you today include the implementation of the Parliament's new financial powers, managing public sector reform and transforming public services. I'm grateful to my colleagues for all their hard work and commitment over the year for what has been challenging and productive for all of us. <coughs> and we will, of course, chair do our best to answer the Commission's questions. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Let me begin by um, asking the first question, which is on page six of the annual report. You state that 96% uh, of central government uh, and 21 further education audit reports were completed by their respective due dates. Can you confirm that the 4% of audits that were not completed on time, what the reasons were for these particular delays? Certainly, Chair, yes. Um, two of them, the Scottish Consolidated Fund and Skills Development Scotland, were th just three days late, um, and that was due to timing difficulties around the audit committees and the sign-off of the audits themselves and really not significant in any way. The third was the Scottish Police Authority, um, and you'll be aware as a member of the Public Audit Committee that I've expressed particular concern about the financial management uh, systems and controls in the SPA. That led to a much more significant delay in the completion of that audit, and indeed to a significant increase in the audit fee that we had to charge for that work. How much extra was that audit fee? The extra fee, Russell, can you help me with the additional fee for that one? From memory, I think it was £40,000. Hmm. Not insignificant. Yeah, of money, yeah. I, I think probably the main thing I'm trying to get reassurance on is that uh, the delays were not caused at any point by lack of resources. No, in neither case What was that the case. As I say, two were very short delays and they were really just um, timing and scheduling difficulties. The SPA was due to problems within the police authority, not within the audit process. But thank you for your concern about the resources we have available. We weren't promising you more. I know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, Jenny, would you like to pick up? Yes, thank you. Convener. On page 10 of the annual report, Audit Scotland advises that there were seven auditor opinions qualified this year, two in further education, one in central government and four in charities. Can I ask, is this a normal number of qualified audit reports in any given year, or is this untypically high, and are there any resource implications for Audit Scotland which may result from qualified audit reports? I'll ask Russell to come in with the detail um, for those seven bodies in a moment. In broad terms, I think it is fairly typical. We haven't yet seen an increase in the number of qualified or modified audit opinions because of the pressure on public bodies. But it obviously is a risk that we're very conscious of, especially as we head into the next um, Scottish parliamentary budget round and for us, a new round of five-year audit appointments. Russell, can you amplify the reasons for those particular bodies? Yes, I, I can indeed. There were... Firstly, to say that none of the qualifications related to the true and fair view of the uh, financial statements. Um, two of them had, two colleges had qualified opinions on their remuneration report due to certain pension information not being included, um, which it was required for the first time to, to be. Um, the police authority 
the modified opinion there was in relation to keeping or not keeping proper accounting records during the year in relation to fixed assets. The issue was eventually resolved uh, post the year end for the accounts, but during the year there was a, an issue. And the other four were local authority charities where their opinions were qualified because the governing documents could not be uh, traced. Now, to give you a bit of context there, these charities have been around for, in some cases, over 100 years through many local government reorganisations and were only just re being required under the charities legislation to be formally audited. Um, so perhaps not too surprisingly, um, the records for some of these very old and small charities weren't uh, complete going right back to the beginning. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, thank you, Convener. Uh, my question relates to the section in your report entitled Improving Our Performance on page 15, um, where you state that um, you're going to be developing a new fees strategy which will be impl implemented during 2016. Could you um, give us an update on this work, um, given the interest of the previous Commission in this area? Yes. We have carried out a consultation with all our client groups. We have looked at the overall feeing arrangements. We are introducing transparency to this. Going forward, there will be no cross-sector subsidies. In other words, each sector, health, local government will pay their own. There may be, within that, some adjustments between local government bodies. Uh, all of the detail of this will be supplied to you in the budget submissions we'll be making to you for the next round, which will be shortly. When we have your timetable, we'll be submitting all the documents. I did give an undertaking last year before the Commission, as the convener will recollect, that this work would be undertaken during this year. It has been done. Can I, I mean, ask a sort of follow-up question? I mean, I used to be a solicitor um, in private practice. And we, I still am. Lucky you. Um, I'm now a reformed character, I like to think. Um, the, the, um, when we were charging clients fees, we had to justify the fee by you know, giving a breakdown of the hours, the chargeable rate for each solicitor involved in, 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 in that work. I mean, how do you work out the basis of the, up until this point, b before these changes come in? I mean, how, how have you worked out the fees that you're charging up until now? Russell will take the detail on that. Thank you. The fees paid by the audited bodies um, are a an amalgam of, of several things. One is the direct cost of carrying out the annual financial audit. And then in there is a sharing out of some central costs, which are apportioned between the bodies um, according to the size of the, the, the audit fee, largely. Um, the fees for the individual audits are worked out on the basis of what we think the uh, risk profile is for a body of that size in that particular part of the public sector, so differently for local government, health, central government. Um, and we set what we call uh, an indicative, or now expected fee, for that audit. That's based on our overall central intelligence. The auditor and the audited body then agree the precise fee based on the individual circumstances. So if some of our expectations around, for example, a good level of internal control, good accounts preparation aren't being met, then the auditor may agree a final fee that's above that expected level. OK, thank you. Rona? Yes, thank you. Um, page 18 relates to staff numbers, um, in particular the, the rising um, number of staff departures um, annually. Can you confirm that um, business cases are in place to demonstrate value for money in the funding of staff departures, um, given that it's increasing year on year? And can you give us an idea of what sort of forward planning goes into that, those rising costs? I'm very happy to. Um, we have a um, voluntary early release agreement policy and practice. It was approved by our remuneration committee and we um, report annually on the savings from previous um, early releases that have been made. Each individual case has to have a business case and it has to generate savings over a three-year period. We report annually on each case to ensure that the savings are continuing to be made. 
that's reported to the remuneration committee annually so it's very tightly managed um, we um, report very clearly on it because we're very keen to demonstrate that we're achieving good value for money um, because we have a no compulsory redundancy policy in reshaping the organisation, we've had two um, possibilities available to us. One is to um, make clear choices when we have voluntary, when we have ordinary turnover and levers from the organisation to decide whether we should continue to fill that post, whether we want to restructure it. And we have run over um, the past few years, but not every year, a voluntary early release scheme where we're looking to um, seek agreement with colleagues um, over their departure. That's helped us fundamentally reshape the organisation um, and has been, um, as I say, one of the two options available for us to do that. And you're, you're quite confident that you are getting value for money from, from these <coughs> accepting these voluntary redundancies? Very much so. Um, the tariff that's in place for the voluntarily release um, agreement um, ensures that we're um, managing the cost to the public purse and the benefits to the public purse very carefully. Thank you. John, back to you. Um, thank you, um, convener. Uh, my next question um, relates to payment to suppliers, which you reference on page 20 of your report. Um, you state that 84% of trade invoices were paid within 10 days, which is very, a very slight fall from 87%, um, which was the, the previous year's um, performance. Um, can you give us any specific reasons why there's been this very marginal fall in, in payment rates? I don't think there are any particular reasons for it. It's simply the changing pattern of um, supplies and invoices coming through. We do monitor it carefully. It's part of the quarterly performance monitoring that goes to the Audit Scotland Board for their attention. Um, and if the trend continues, obviously, we'll drill further into it. But the evidence for last year suggested it was just a, a normal business variation. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alison? Um, thank you, convener. Um, page 21 of the annual report, um, reports an underspend by Audit Scotland of £834,000 during 2015-16, um, uh, which equates to 8.4% of the total resource requirement that was approved by Parliament. And I'd just like to understand um, if, you have a, if Audit Scotland have a target for underspends, as 8.4% does seem relatively high. It's a very good question, Ms Johnston. I think the first thing to say is that we do aim to underspend. Um, if we overspend the budget that's approved by Parliament and the SCPA, our accounts are automatically qualified, and you'll understand that's very bad news for me as the Auditor General, so we go to some lengths to make sure that doesn't happen. Of the 834 shown in the report, 125 relates directly to our capital budget, um, and that reflects the savings we were able to make on the contract for fitting out our new offices at Westport. Um, that was a large capital contract last year. We made some significant savings, and that will be returned to the Consolidated Fund as unused. Within the um, revenue uh, part of our budget, the uh, underspend was about £700,000. Um, we can give you a more detailed breakdown if it would be useful. But the two big things contributing to that were, first of all, higher than budgeted fee income. Fee income was about £390,000, mm -hmm. um, higher than um, expected um, in there because of extra work required for things like the Scottish Police Authority, um, but also new bodies coming on in the year and other uh, movements at the margin. And the second was a reduction in our property running costs. Um, you'll see a reference in the annual report to the cost of the dilapidations that we had to pay to our landlord in George Street being lower than the provision we've made. That released about £270,000 to our revenue account, again, that we couldn't have budgeted for in advance. Okay. Um, we would aim to keep our underspend lower than that in normal circumstances, mm -hmm. but the property move last year particularly um, made it higher than we would have planned for. So you've obviously... If you could give us a, a breakdown of that in writing so we can just... Convener. Yeah. Could I Thank just you. ask, uh, there was obviously unexpected savings mm. and perhaps unexpected income there. Is there an opportunity to recycle some of that underspend back into the public sector at a time of incredibly tight budgets? Yes, we don't have the ability to hold reserves at all. So um, if we underspend our budget, there are two broad options. One, if it's significant and it relates to the audit work that we carry out directly, we can make a refund of fees to audited bodies, and we have done that in the past. 
The other option is that it simply returned to the Scottish Consolidated Fund and is available for recycling. Um, we can't hold reserves, so we're aiming to balance our budget each year on the nose of the total that's approved by Parliament for us. If I may, convener, this is something which is exercised myself and the board members because we are conscious that when we ask, as we'll be in the next few weeks when we come before you for the next budget round, we are asking for something which top slices the Consolidated Fund. And we're very conscious if we ask for too much. It's a denial that year for some other body having a resource. It's all very well having an underspend at the end of the year, and we have to have some margin there. But we're taking a sort of, I've used the term before, a very sharp pencil to this, and we're looking at it to try and make sure that the margin of underspend is reduced year on year, so it doesn't, at the point you make rather validly, deny to other sectors that money up front as opposed to year end. Convener, might I follow up with a, another question? Um, we're told in the annual report um, the, the section about us that the aim of a world-class audit organisation, well, part of that is about identifying risks. Um, and I just wondered if, you know, if we want to improve the use of public money, if you ever look at anything um, like, you know, the collapse of Scottish coal, for example, um, exposed a series of woefully inadequate insurance and bond schemes, schemes set up with local authorities that might have a you know, a really significant impact on public finance. Is that the sort of risk that Audit Scotland would be looking at? It's certainly one of the sorts of risks we're looking at. Um, and you're right that the open cast mining claims that we saw, first of all, in East Ayrshire were a wake-up call for everybody, I think, about some of the longer-term liabilities that might be around that people weren't paying attention to. We've looked closely at um, related claims for open cast mining, um, waste disposal sites, potentially, where there's a liability longer term that, that will have to be met and making sure that the, those um, risks are in place. Um, one of the things that um, I've been um, making a priority as Auditor General is making sure that public bodies' financial reporting is as clear as it can be about what those risks are. Um, and that goes all the way from local authorities through to the Scottish Government itself in terms of making sure that it's transparent what long-term liabilities and long-term commitments are. And we aim to do that both bottom-up through our knowledge of individual authorities and public bodies and top-down, thinking about an issue like open cast coal mining and what the parallels might be for other public bodies around the place. Um, we're always keen to hear from people with an interest or a specialist insight into things that might not be getting the attention they deserve at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can I move to you, Jenny? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I'd like to ask about benefits in kind. Um, on page 31, the annual report states that a benefit in kind provided for the Director of Audit Services has increased by 18% from £3,800 to £4,500. Um, can you please explain the precise nature of this benefit in kind and its increase of 18% from last year. And further, can Audit Scotland explain the governance arrangements in place for granting such additional employee benefits? kind that's referred to on the table there relates to the provision of a leased car for the employer, employee concerned. Um, we have a leased car scheme which is available to um, a number of our staff who are required to travel for their work. You'll understand that auditing 220 bodies across Scotland, it's important that we do have staff who are mobile um, and able to get to where they need to be. Um, Diane, I think, can talk you through the detail of the governance for that um, and the increase for the individual that you're seeing here um, in the annual report. Um, I think the increase relates to the um, expiry of a, the, the routine replacement um, of the, um, the car. We, the cars are provided for on a four-year lease period. Um, we've done a lot of work over the past um, few years to reduce the overall cost of the car leasing arrangements that we have, and those have contributed to some efficiencies that we've made. We currently have 105 um, lease cars in the scheme. They're part of the terms and conditions of employees um, devoted, who are working on frontline audit um, work. Um, the membership of the car scheme has um, shrunk over the past few years, and as you'll see in our carbon reporting, we are um, consciously looking at effectively managing the um, mileage um, and so on that people do. So the car scheme itself um, has been in existence for some time. We're currently looking at the wider um, 
pay terms and conditions of colleagues and the um, car scheme is in the mix of those discussions. Correct me if, if I'm wrong, Diane. I don't know if there are um, highlights of the... Uh, if it's detailed in the report, the other staff who um, have benefits in kind so that we can see the other cars and if there has been such a large increase of 18%. Can you give me any idea of how many cars we're talking about and if the replacements all total 18% to see if this is an average kind of increase? I think the... Um I can certainly, in terms of the detail of that question, I'd be very happy to come back to you um, and supply that. The presentation of the benefit in kind um, in the table here is part of the accounting requirements, and those requirements apply to the management team members of, um, of Audit Scotland or other public bodies. So there's not an accounting requirement for us to present that information um, for all staff, but we'd be very happy to, um, to give that to you. Our, um, as I think as mentioned, we have 105 cars at the moment. Um, in total, um, our lease commitments are um, total about 970,000. Mm -hmm. I can break that down to you. There are some people at the beginning of leases and, um, and some people coming to the end of them. Overall, the contract we have for the supply of the vehicles, um, we retendered um, within the past 12 months and we're bringing down the cost of that, but we haven't run off all of the older contracts that we had. But I can certainly provide you with more information if that would help. That would useful, so you can give us more information on the car scheme so we can see if 18... Because 18 just seems like quite a huge increase year on year in terms of benefit in kind. Um, what's the decision-making process behind signing off um, that 18% increase? The contribution that Audit Scotland makes to any car is fixed. I can't um, recall the, the current value of it. I think it's fixed at about £3,000. I don't know, Russell, if you know the detail of it. So the cost to Audit Scotland is absolutely fixed. Um, individuals may request additional um, features on cars that we don't pay for, but the individual is, is paying for. And in accounting terms, Russell, I don't know if you have a better definition of benefit in kind in relation to cars that might help. In relation to the cars, the value that's recorded there is the HMRC benefit in kind value for the car, not necessarily the precise cash cost to Audit Scotland. Thank you. Audit Scotland, makes, Audit Scotland makes is a flat rate regardless of, of who the employee is or um, and so on. There's one scheme for all employees and there's a flat rate contribution from Audit Scotland. Thank you. Again, could I ask you maybe to write to us and give us a little bit of detail around that? Jenny, I think you're still... Yes. Uh, another question from me. Um, page 48 on the annual account shows an increase of £451,000, which is a 68% increase in the costs of the Local Government Retirement Benefits Scheme. Um, can you explain, please, the background to this cost and the reason for the significant year-on-year -year increase? And Russell's our expert in these very complicated pension accounting issues. Okay, thank you. Right, uh, first of all, Audit Scotland... Uh, is a member of two different public sector schemes. The vast majority of our staff are in are members of the local government scheme, which is a funded scheme. Um, we happen to be in the Lothian uh, pension scheme. A small number of staff remain in, in the uh, principal uh, civil service scheme. There is a significant difference in the accounting for the two. For the civil service scheme, we simply record the employee contribute the employer contributions in our accounts as the cost of pensions however for the local government scheme we have to include the full actuarial value of the pension benefit in the year and that uh, goes up and down quite in a quite volatile way depending on movements in assumptions uh, around discount rates uh, longevity um, and uh, salary increases for that matter. So the increase uh, and, and the, the, the cost of our pension scheme is actually quite volatile. The, the volatility is a non-cash cost um, 
And so in this case, for 2016, you see a uh, £1.1 million uh, adjustment for retirement benefit scheme costs. That is the additional cost that the actuary believes is the full cost of providing pensions in the year, the pension contributions in the year, above the amount that we actually pay into the scheme. Over the life of the scheme, that number evens out to zero, and indeed in some years has been a negative number. But it's a non-cash cost, and it's to do with the accounting for funded schemes, um, which we're, we're required to, to follow. Thank you. Okay. Um, looking at page 54 uh, of the report, uh, the actual expenditure shows a significant underspending accommodation costs, travel and subsistence. Uh, were there specific reasons for that? Is it, is it just sufficient budgeting or were there particular reasons, given the fact that uh, obviously the number of audits and so on being done have not reduced... Russell, do you want to answer? In relation to accommodation, this is uh, starting to see the benefits of the move from two offices to one that we made last November, but is also the, I think in there is also the, uh, the benefit of uh, agreeing lower dilapidations on our existing, our previous buildings uh, than we had originally provided for. Although rent and rates quite a jump was that because you were That's, paying duplicate rate rent we were or? double we were double running costs for part of the 2015-16 year wouldn't so you have known that when you budgeted in 2015 no scrub yeah, that yeah. doesn't make sense uh, the uh, the other thing is there's been quite a quite a big increase in information technology between two years, 335 moving to 461. It's quite a substantial increase. Yes, that's uh, again partly related to the to the move uh, and the installate some of the installation of uh, new equipment, new cabling in the in the new office. It's also uh, we have improved, increased the resilience and backup uh, facilities for our. IT equipment. We used to keep it within our George Street offices, but now having moved to one office, um, that's no longer uh, a sensible arrangement. So we now have off-site uh, backup facilities in place. And also in the same year, the cost of some of our uh, software licenses that uh, we need to operate the core systems also increased. On page 14, I was rather curious about uh the section on audit quality, where you say audit quality is independently reviewed by other UK audit agencies. How does that work? A couple of approaches to ensuring the quality of our audit work, given its absolute fundamental importance to what we do. Um, first of all, each of the audit groups within Audit Scotland is required to have its own um, internal peer review process in place. Um, but we also do have external peer review arrangements with our colleagues in the National Audit Office, the Wales Audit Office and the Northern Ireland Audit Office, where they will do cold reviews, particularly of performance audits after the event, to ensure that um, we're meeting professional standards and to make suggestions for improvement. Um, Alongside all of that, Russell's team has got responsibility for providing assurance to me, to the Accounts Commission and to the Board about the quality of all of the audit work that's carried out on our behalf. The firms that we appoint are subject to regulation either by ICAS or ICAEW. For the in-house team that's carrying out annual audits, we've had a contract in place for the last few years with ICAS to review a sample of audits to provide us with that assurance that they're complying with the um, international standards on auditing and the ethical standards that we comply with. So what tools do these other agencies use to assess you? 
Um, we all have um, our own audit management and performance audit management frameworks that we use, and actually those frameworks themselves learn from each other to make sure that we're applying best practice. So it's more a process assessment. Absolutely. They, they will also give feedback if they think that our conclusions could have gone further or that um, we could have benefited from a different approach to analysing data, but really they're, they're making sure that we've complied with the project management and the audit frameworks that we have in place. On page 15, you say under securing world-class audit, bu audit bullet point one that you're developing a new code of audit practice for public audit in Scotland. Um, that sounds quite a big undertaking, and uh, presumably we're not doing it in isolation, that we're taking ideas and so on from elsewhere. How are you approaching this? Russell, do you want to answer that? Yes, indeed. The, the new code has, has been issued um, because it applies from the start of the new audit appointments, which will be kicking off next week. Um, we've had a code in place for um, many years. We revise it every five years. Um, the idea is to have a, a public um, statement of what our expectations of, of audit are. Uh, and in revising it, yes, we look at the uh, similar codes that are in place around the rest of the, the UK. We look at what we're trying to achieve from audit where we're trying to perhaps lead the way, um, go further than might be required uh, in, for say, a Companies Act audit. So particularly where we are going beyond uh, a pure financial statements audit into the wider scope of public audit around governance, financial sustainability and so on, the code is the place where we set out our, our high level expectations in, in those areas. Would it be possible to see a copy? Yes, certainly. Yes. It's not something that sort of naturally you browse in the course of your day, but it'd be something maybe of interest to, to the to the members. On page twenty one, um, you've got other finance income. I'm just a little curious on this, and it, it says that it's the expected interest income from the local government pension scheme assets less the interest payable. Maybe I could get a bit more information on that because it's unusual to see anything to do with pensions. It comes out. I'm not sure if that's positive or not, actually. <laughs> that is the place in a set of financial statements where we're now required to include the actuarial assessments of the interest that we would notionally receive on our share of the pension fund's assets. Notwithstanding that the pension fund assets are already invested elsewhere and have their own income. Yes, I'm struggling with that. It is a required accounting treatment, Chair. We find it complicated as well, um, as you will know from um, working with us on this issue over a number of years. But that's the way we're required to account for it in the annual report and accounts. OK, there's not much to say about that. It's, uh, <laughs> it is what it is, I suppose. Um, Now, fee strategy you're going to be bringing forward to us yes. with the uh, with the uh, budget. Um, governance, which is obviously something that uh, uh, the Scottish Commission, previous one and and possibly this one, might be looking at. What are you actually doing to review your own governance at the moment? We have reviewed our standing orders. And we've looked at the question of how our quorum is made up. Now, the Auditor General and the Chairman of the Local Authority Accounts Commission are by statute members of the board, as you're aware, Convener. There is a provision in our standing orders that stipulates that both have to be in attendance, otherwise the meeting is in quorum. Uh, there's a reason for that, going back some time, and that is to say since the primary function of the Audit Scotland Board is to ensure the supply of the services and staff required by both the Auditor General and the Local Authority Accounts Commission in order to discharge their statutory functions, that the, both these representatives should be in attendance when a material matter is considered. It does pose potentially uh, a difficulty in that if one is unable to attend for whatever reason, then we simply cannot deliberate any business. And that is something we've considered. I did say to you some time ago that we would look at this question. We've had a long discussion on it. 
And what we are doing is saying that each person has to commit <coughs> to a specific date to ensure that we are core it. It doesn't take away the potential of someone being abducted or for whatever reason and taken away or falling under the proverbial number 22 bus that we could be in core it. But nevertheless, there's a balance of issues here and we've discussed it and we consider the current arrangements for the time being should continue because they haven't proved a difficulty, but we are aware of the potential for difficulty. But we want to ensure that the Auditor General and the Chairman of the Local Authority Accounts Commission are satisfied that their statutory interests are being protected by the way we operate. So we did undertake to look at it, we have looked at it and we're staying with the existing arrangements for the CFA over the future, but we are going to review this on an annual basis with all our standing orders. If there are practical difficulties, we shall try and deal with them, but that's the reason for it. More generally, convener, the board has been paying a great deal of attention to the implications of the Parliament's new financial powers and more recently the result of the EU referendum for Audit Scotland's work and the governance. Um, and we spent a day in September um, looking very specifically at the ways we work and making sure we're equipped to do it. Um, I think we agreed that we all think it's fit for purpose at the moment and that we will continue to keep it under review. And if any matters come out of that process that we should draw to your attention, we'll certainly do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I ask members of the Ellison? You've got. Can I just specifically on that last point? I mean, do you have any particular views on Audit Scotland's role in the new fiscal framework? Yes, we've um, done a lot of work on this over the last couple of years, initially in relation to the Scotland Act 2012, which is just now fully in place, and obviously since then on the Scotland Act 2016 and any further changes that come from the EU referendum. Um, we've published a number of papers, including a briefing paper that we produced just yesterday um, on the new financial powers, which sets out questions for um, all of us, the Government, Parliament and Audit Scotland, about the way some of that will work. We do expect it to lead to some additional audit work, not least through the establishment of things like the new Social Security Agency, the need to make sure the Scottish Parliament has assurance on taxes that are collected on its behalf by HMRC at a UK level, um, benefits that continue to be administered by DWP that interact with the social security powers here, um, and the new Scottish Fiscal Commission, for example. Um, equally, we think there's um, a role for us in helping the development of the financial information that's available to the Scottish Parliament in making decisions about the new tax and spending powers. Um, so we'll continue to play that role, and indeed I'm meeting here tomorrow with the Budget Review Group to help shape some of those processes. We do expect it to have an impact on our work. It's too soon to say what it is, but the organisation and the board are very closely focused on what the implications might be for us and making sure we're properly equipped to, to respond to them. Okay. Um, a, a sort of more specific event that might have an impact on planning in the shorter term is the late budget. Um, obviously, Westminster's later, we're going to be later. Will that have an impact on your work or ability to plan? Um, not so much in this year, I think. that um, th At the moment, most of our work does focus on the annual audit accounts at the end of a financial year. There's no doubt it will cause difficulties for some of the bodies that we audit, um, some more than others, and we'll have to look at how we work with them to minimise the impact of those difficulties. I think our bigger interest is in making sure the Parliament's able to put in place a budget process that really does give you time to scrutinise the proposals on tax and spending, to understand the choices that are in Implicit in that and to involve the wider public in some of that discussion and we're very keen to play our part in helping the development of that process. Thank you. Thank you. Do any other members have any questions they would like to ask the witnesses? No? In that case, Ian, Carlin, do you have anything you would like to add? We're fine. Thank you, thank you very much. In that case, thank you much, very much for your evidence and attending and uh, look forward to working together over the next session. And as agreed at the beginning of the meeting, we move into private. <laughs>